If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. and welcome once again to our program. This is Larry Wessels, your host. I'm the director of Christian Answers, a Christian ministry which brings the biblical perspective to a wide range of issues and subjects. And today's subject is on the world religion of Islam, also known as the Muslim religion. And joining me in this series of programs dealing with Islam is my close associate with Christian Answers and our director of research, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here, brother. Oh, thank you very much. Well, this is going to be a long and detailed series on a very big topic, mm -hmm. a, a topic that many people obviously have heard about, Islam, the Muslim religion. And the title for this series, and this is program number one in this series, is Can the Muslim Religion send someone to hell. Now I know in Islam they talk about hell, they talk about Jesus, they talk about Abraham, they talk about a lot of things the Bible talks about. Mm -hmm. And so when we talk about hell, hell is a subject that's also acknowledged as being a real place in Islam. Very much. Yeah. So we're trying to get to the the crux of the matter here to answer this question by going through a whole series analyzing the religion of Islam and finding out can believing the Muslim religion send you to hell? Muslims believe in hell, Christians believe in hell, and so obviously everyone that's sincere in their religious faith is trying to avoid this place. <laughs> if you're a Christian you have faith in Christ because you, by believing on Him He has atoned for your sins and therefore you are saved from the wrath of God which can send you to hell. And Muslims, uh, likewise, are trying to do the will of Allah, submitting themselves to the will of Allah, following the, the pillars of the faith and, and these things, to escape the judgment of Allah and end up in hell. So what we want to find in this series is, does the Muslim religion have you escape from hell, or can it, by its very nature, by the very teachings of Islam, send you to hell? Okay, Steve, uh, the subject of this this series is can believing the Muslim religion send someone to hell mm -hmm. but basically you're the one who inspired this topic in fact you're uh, you're our director of research at Christian Answers you're our, our, our main gun you might say when it comes to dealing in in-depth uh, analytical research into different topics topics and subjects for this particular series you've done quite extensive research into the religion of Islam uh, but how, how did we arrive at this particular title? What is it that brought about this title? Can the Muslim religion send someone to hell? Well, a friend of mine was giving a, a talk actually on Christianity, not related to Islam, and there was a Muslim in the audience who uh, politely asked a question. He, he basically said that if, um, if someone rejects that Jesus is uh, the Son of God and, and, and that He is our Savior, uh, does, do, does Christianity teach that He will go to hell? And my friend basically said, yes, that is what the Bible teaches. And the Muslim said, thank you. He said, that's the very first time I've heard that from a Christian. And to me, when I heard that, that was amazing. That all of these Christians here Basically, at least the Christians he talked to were not getting the message out that there is a choice to make and that either Jesus is our Savior and He is the Son of God or He's not. 
but um, but according to the Bible, if you do not believe that the that the way of salvation is through Jesus shed blood on the cross, you, uh, if you reject that, you will go to hell. And we need to make it clear in a loving way uh, that, that we don't want Muslims to go to hell. We want them to go to heaven with us. But mm -hmm. that according to the Bible, they will go to hell if they reject Jesus. And we need to show them uh, exactly why it is that. Christianity is right and Islam is wrong, not because of any hatred of them or, or animosity, but because we would like to be with them forever in heaven by them accepting Christ's blood on the cross. Because it, basically it's a caring for our uh, Muslim neighbors and friends, people that we're associated with. We don't hate them when we disagree with their theological perspective. It's, it's much like uh, if you see it could even be a stranger uh, craning down a road that you know the bridge is out up ahead. Mm -hmm. It's an old example, but it's so true. What kind of person will we be if we didn't warn them the bridge is out up there? Right. They're going, uh, you know, uh, pretty fast, and they may not realize it. They go over the cliff and get killed unless we warn them. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the same analogy here with Islam. We believe Islam to be a religion once analyzed, as we will analyze it in detail. Uh, especially from a theological and biblical point of view in contrast to uh, Quranic teachings and mm -hmm. teachings of Muhammad we, we find that uh, Islam basically represents a bridge that is out <laughs> and since we have studied this and know better and we see our Muslim friends going down you know going 100 miles an hour down the highway heading towards that bridge that's not there mm -hmm. over a cliff well, we, being friends and not enemies, are simply trying to do the humane thing, which is to warn them. Right. And, 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 and the Muslim in fairness may ask us, how do you know this? How do you know that it's the bridge of Islam out and Christianity is good versus the other way around? That's a good and it's, point. And it's a fair question, and in this series, we're basically going to answer that question. Exactly. Exactly. Well, uh, let's begin this series with, of course, uh, the beginnings. Anytime you begin something, you might as well start mm -hmm. with the beginning. So what about the origins of Islam? Okay. And of course, for our viewers out there, we do have a track that Steve himself has done with his research called Origins of Islam. And of course, materials that we'll be mentioning, things we'll be referencing to, uh, are available for anyone that wants to contact the ministry here. Uh, tracks, articles, uh, uh, reference material that could be useful in your own research and study. Oh, and before Steve answers that question about the origins of Islam, I, I, I can't resist the fact that uh, if our camera can get it, uh, Steve, right behind you here, if you could point it out for the viewers real set, you don't have to move from your position, but just kind of lean back and show. Mm. We, we, you have a bunch of Muslim books back here that our research and studies will take us into. What, what exactly we have? We have a, a Holy Quran we, back we, there. We, we have a Holy Quran in Arabic and English, al along with some very interesting footnotes and kind of commentary. A number of, of, of books on Islam uh, on, by various authors. We have the Bukhari Hadith, um, which are extremely important in, actually all the four sections of Hadith are extremely important in Sunni Islam, and there are other types of Islam too. We have the Sahih Muslim Hadith, we have the Fiqh Sunnah Hadith, and then we have the Riyadh uh, Sa Salihin Hadith. And we'll be getting into those and what they say and the implications of that for different kinds of Muslims later. But uh, I guess my study of Islam is not only just talking to a number of Muslims, but also reading the source materials that, that, uh, themselves and you know saying, well, this is what Muhammad said and this is what he apparently did, uh, and discussing you know getting from the horse's mouth, so to speak, rather than just you know hearing on on say so from other people. So what you're telling me and what you're telling the viewers is you just haven't just read a, a little pamphlet or a few tracks and said, oh, I'm going to blast Islam because this. What you're telling us here, based on what we just looked at, is that you have you yourself have dug into these books, into the Quran, into the al-Bukhari Hadith and, and, and so forth, and researched it for yourself. I, I, I've read all of the Hadith, covered all of those four Hadith, cover to cover, and read the entire Quran, of course. And so you're, we're dealing with a person here that has done his homework and done the research and not just reading a pamphlet or something and, right. and taking someone else's word. So I just wanted to establish that for our viewers right off the bat that you have, you have done your homework to get ready for this series. Mm -hmm. All right, now, with that established for our viewer, start 
given us uh, some background here, what are the origins of Islam from All right. your research? Well, you can't understand anything about Islam without knowing something about Muhammad. Uh, and without knowing the times and place that he lived. Okay, uh, uh, Muhammad uh, was born in Mecca, and Mecca was a very, uh, very unusual place at that time. Uh, it, at the time of Muhammad's birth, there was a central, you might call it a sanctuary, uh, called the Kaaba, and there were 360 uh, gods uh, that were worshipped in there. And the, the Quraysh, the tribe that controlled Mecca, um, they had this as like a religious sanctuary, so regardless of your religion, you could go in there and you could worship there, and of course you could leave money there too. Um, <laughs> and for example, uh, they had a picture of Jesus if Christians would want to go in there. Uh, they, they had 360 various idol, idols there. Uh, one of the idols they had there uh, was the Quraysh's own god, uh, whom, whom the Quraysh called Allah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, it, uh, Muhammad's father, who died before he was born, was called Abdallah or Abdullah, and Abd means slave of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Allah was established, and Allah was worshipped, uh, you know, I guess a polytheistic way uh, by the Quraysh even before Muhammad was born. Uh, the other things that that the uh, Quraysh uh, would do is that they would pray five times toward Mecca. Uh, the, the, uh, this is prior to Muhammad. They would fast part of the day for an entire month. Okay, which Muslims do today during the month of Ramadan. Okay, the Quraysh fasted on the 10th of the month of uh, M-Y-H-A-R-R-A-M. Uh, I won't try to pronounce it. Uh, Muhammad ordered Muslims to do that also, uh, but later that became optional, you know, that, that particular day. Uh, they made pilgrimages, uh, Umrah, it's called to Mecca. This is the pre-Islamic Arabs. And they thought that not performing the pilgrimage was one of the major sins on earth. Okay. They covered the Kaaba with cloth, and they had a sacred month to where they didn't have any war with the surrounding tribes. So a lot of these, many of these customs, uh, though they had other, though not every custom, uh, were kind of incorporated from the from the Quraysh's worship of Allah into Islam. In addition to that, uh, there were a number of Christians and Jews in Mecca and Medina, and there are many aspects of Judaism and Christianity uh, that are incorporated at least partway into Islam. For example, there are many Jewish dietary laws. Okay, uh, you can't eat pork, you can't eat camel meat, things like that. Well, in Islam, you cannot eat pork, but camel meat is okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the, uh, uh, the Jewish people have sacrifices, the, the, the Muslims they've had sacrifices, though of course the, the Christians don't because Christ is our final sacrifice. There are some things from apocryphal Jewish works uh, that, that even have very similarities to the Quran that, that Muhammad you know, may have heard and, and put in. But anyway, when you talk about the five pillars of Islam, uh, the, four of the five pillars uh, were practiced before Muhammad's time. The first pillar uh, said there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. Obviously that was not practiced before Muhammad, but the other all were in some form or another. And you're talking about the pilgrimage to Mecca and, right. and the, pray, the prayers and the almsgiving and mm -hmm. things of this nature. Right. Okay, and then uh, what can you tell us about uh, Muhammad himself? Uh, uh, he had wives, concubines. Uh, what, what are things about Muhammad? Like, uh, was he prosperous? Was he a sinner? I mean, what? Wait, what wait, wait, wait. Well, first of all, uh, uh, Muhammad, was, when he was a young man, he married an older woman named Khadija, and he was sort of he was her husband, and he was also sort of like a manager. She was uh, fairly wealthy, and then and and uh, and she died before he married any other wives. And it was during this time that he had a revelation, uh, and he wasn't sure where it was from. Uh, was it from a demon? Should he commit suicide? Was it from God? You know, what, you know, what, what, what happened to him? What, what, you know, what, um, he wasn't sure about that. But then uh, he uh, thought that was from God, and later he he was married, and the the chart uh, shows all of the wives that he had. Uh, there it is on the screen. Yeah, uh, Muhammad's wives uh, and concubines. Uh, some of the more interesting ones were Aisha. He married when she was eight or nine years old, and he apparently consummated the marriage. You know, only about two or three years later. Um, in the Quran, it actually says that uh, that you can only have uh, four, a maximum of four wives. Uh, however, there was an exception made for Muhammad, and uh, 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 
it, I've heard various reasons for that, like, um, you know, maybe God, Allah wanted him to be happy, or maybe he just, when the generals died in war, someone had to take care of the wives, and so he married the, the widows and, and, and things like that. But, but some of the other ones, um, uh, for example, uh, Safiya was actually uh, the wife of a, uh, leader, of a leader in a Jewish town or Jewish section called Kabar, and all the Jews were, were ma all the Jewish men were massacred. And the Muslims saw her and saw that she was very beautiful, and so she got married as a wife of Muhammad. Um, of course, she wasn't a Muslim before the Jews were massacred, uh, so that kind of blows the, the Muhammad just marrying his you know generals' wives after they died to take care of him theory. Mm -hmm. uh, he had some slaves and, and concubines. Uh, Mary, the Christian, uh, who always was a Christian, uh, it, uh, she never converted to Islam, and you know she could have perhaps been a regular wife if she converted, but she sh she chose not to convert. And then there are four women, and this list, by the way, came from uh, a Muslim, Iranian Muslim scholar, uh, perhaps who disappeared under Khomeini, named Ali Dashti, and in his book, 23 Years in the Life of the Prophet. Mm. And four women, Am Sharik, Maimuna, Zainab, Zainab or Zainab III, uh, Kala, uh, these women presented themselves to Muhammad, basically saying, you know, we give ourselves to you. And it's a little, doesn't really say, well, what did Muhammad do with him? Did he send him away? Did he marry him? Was there a temporary marriage? Uh, they, they, there are no facts in the case, except we know that they, that they present them to them. But, but with all, all of these wives here, uh, Muhammad, you know, he, he, I guess, needed a lot to support all these wives. He, of course, each in their own tent and everything. And there was actually a case where there was um, uh, kind of a rivalry and almost a, a for the affections of Muhammad uh, between Aisha and Safiya and some of the other wives some of the older wives basically would uh, give their time to one of the other wives and there's a lot of political intrigue going on including one month where Muhammad basically got mad at all of their wives because they were uh, 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 trying to uh, bas uh, uh, basically connive, you know, uh, for various purposes, and he didn't like that. So well, how do you know that? Where do you get that uh, information? Uh, uh, this is from the Bukhari uh, Hadith. Uh, where, oh, where so you're getting this information from the Hadith when right. you say that stuff. Right. Uh, which are considered authoritative uh, by Sunni Muslims, but they're not authoritative necessarily by Shiite Muslims or Alawites or, or Ahmadiyya or some of the other Muslims. So only only the, the Sunnis really hold the Al-Bakari Hadiths in high esteem. Actually they hold all, all, all four sets of Hadiths. Now the others hold them in some esteem though, but it's sort of like think kind of maybe more pick and choose. You know, pick and choose, things. mix and match, yeah. wherever but, they but, want. But, but we'll get to that later. Right. Now, now, now one of the most interesting marriages uh, was with Zainab of Jash, uh, wife number six. Is on, on, on Ali Dashi's list. Okay, Zainab of, of Jash. She was married to uh, Muhammad's adopt, adopted son, uh, Zayed. Mm -hmm. And anyway, uh, Muhammad apparently asked Zayed to divorce her, and he didn't. And then all of a sudden, a surah uh, appeared, uh, which was in the Quran, which many Muslims believe was preserved, you know, in, written in heaven uh, prior to ever being on earth. Uh, okay, now here's a chart we have on it on the screen, and this is what you're talking about right yes, here. Yes, and, 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 and the quote, I'll go ahead and read it. This is right out of the Quran. Surah now, third. Uh, yes, this is in the Quran. Surah 33, 36 through 38. Right. It is not for any believer, man or woman, when God and his messenger have decreed a matter, to have the choice in the affair. Whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger has gone astray in a manifest error. When you said to him whom Allah had blessed and you had favored, keep your wife to yourself and fear Allah, and you were concealing within yourself what Allah should reveal, fearing other men, and Allah has better right for you to fear him. So when Zayed had accomplished what he would of her, then we, meaning Allah, kind of the royal we, gave her in marriage to you, so that there should not be any fault in the believers, touching the wives of their adopted sons, when they have accomplished what they would of them, and Allah's commandment must be performed. There is no fault in the prophet, touching what Allah had ordained for him. Okay, what this is saying, uh, sounds a little double talk to some people, but what it's saying is that it's a sin to not divorce your wife when Allah has told you to divorce your wife so that Muhammad can marry her. Okay. So he's going to marry his own daughter-in-law? Right. Which, which is, um, I, I don't know how that was charitable for her or anything else. 
Zaid uh, said that, uh, actually uh, Zainab used to boast before the other wives that the prophet, uh, that Allah married him to the prophet in the heavens because there's a whole surah that talks about her being married to Allah. So she used to boast about that. And where she boasted about that is in the Bukhar Hadith, volume 9, uh, number 517. Also look at numbers 516 and 518. So, um, you know, Muhammad could basically, it appears like, make up a surah about, um, you know, whoever he's supposed to marry, even his adopted son's wife, and she has to marry him because, it, you know, if you, uh, you know, you don't want to disobey Allah. So, you know, Muhammad could get his wives pretty much however he wanted. Um, now, uh, also in the Hadith, it mentions uh, in Al Bukhari uh, 7:22. And after 436, and then also in 3, 432, and 5, 459, I'm just reading the references you've given me. Mm -hmm. uh, many references here. What does it say about uh, female slaves? Okay, it, is it uh, is it Muslims, especially Muslim warriors, it was okay to have sex uh, with women their right hand possesses. So if they captured women in war, uh, they could have sex with them. And they, and they actually asked Muhammad about this in the mosque. And they asked about various sexual practices. And Muhammad said, well, basically, if, if a, a soul is going to exist, it's going to exist. And if it's not, it's not. So don't worry about you know, contraceptive kinds of, of things. Um, and, and, and also, uh, they said that they could have temporary marriage which m most Sunnis say was only for that period of time, and you can't have temporary marriages anymore. But some Sunnis and Shiites say temporary marriage is okay. In Iran, uh, there was, uh, it was said it w Muslims were warned, don't go out, don't spend time you know, with a prostitute, or if you do spend time with a prostitute, at least get married for the night. So then it will be okay yeah. you know, to, to ha have a temporary marriage That's like that. That's pretty temporary, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so people say that Muslim morality and Christian and Jewish morality Morality or Judeo-Christian morality are very similar. It says, well, not in that case. Or not. <laughs> <laughs> that's true because that's very alien to what we find in the Bible. Right, right, right. And it's not me saying this because I heard this secondhand, or I'm not making this up. But this is actually in the references that that, that you just uh, quoted in Bukhari Hadith, which is you right. know, um, you know, very authoritative for Sunni Muslims. Also, uh, I think one I forgot to mention was Bukhari eight six hundred. Is that okay. volume eight? 600, is that what that reference uh, right. is? Right. Well, I made number 600, yeah. Now, uh, before we keep talking about Muhammad the man, I, I want to go back to something I uh, uh, kind of skipped over a minute ago. Now, Muhammad is the prophet of Allah, and mm -hmm. he, he's picking up these pillars of Islam, as we discovered before, the almsgiving, the, the fasting, and the prayer. fasting yeah. prayer, the Mecca pilgrimage and all this. Uh, but he's, he's, he's got this God, Allah, and uh, where is, can you get, give me some background information on the word Allah? Okay. Uh, is it a well, generic well, word well, or what's the deal on that? Well, th there's, there's kind of a debate in which uh, uh, Muslims try to point out and say, well, Allah is a generic word for God. If you look at, at a Christian Bible in Arabic, when it mentions God, it will say Allah. Okay, and the many Christians say, no, it was a specific idol. Okay, so let me give you the evidence on both sides before I give you what my conclusion is. All right, in Arabic, al ilah means the God. And of course, Allah would just simply be a contraction of that. Okay, now Arabic is very close to Hebrew and other Mideastern languages, and there's another word called El, which means God in Hebrew, and it means also in Ugaritic and also in Canaanite. Uh, Ugaritic, uh, Ugarit was like in kind of North Lebanon and Syria area mm -hmm. uh, on the coast. And so Allah and El probably derive from each other. Okay. Also, the Kaaba was called Beit Allah or House of Allah. Okay. So, so there is evidence that Allah is a generic word. I mean, it, all right. On the other hand, the, out of those 360 idols in the House of Allah, one specific idol was called Allah. So at least to the Quraysh, it was a specific idol. Okay. Uh, the tribe of the Quraysh, they didn't have any other name for this, you know, Allah that they had. Uh, Muhammad's father, I always mentioned, was called Abdullah. Uh, also, Muslims themselves, when they talk about Allah, could you say that Hindus worship Allah? They worship many Allahs, you know, because they worship many gods. You know, I don't think a Muslim would really say that because a Muslim, you know, because of course they're, they're false Allahs but, or false gods, but I don't think that, that they even think of, of Allah as really a generic term just for God. You know. In fact, uh, you have a chart here for this. Allah was also a specific idol. 
yes. and you're mentioning these things, one of 360 idols of Mecca. Right. And you just talked about Muhammad's father was named, how do you say that? Abdu Abdu Abdullah or Abdallah, you know. Okay. And then you just mentioned the, uh, uh, are there many Allahs that people worship like the Hindus? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the people are seeing the chart at home. Continue with this. This is fascinating. Uh, 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 well, well, one of the most interesting things is that Allah to the Quraysh was a male idol, a male god that had three daughters. And the daughters were named Lot, Uza, also Al Uza or the Uza, and Manat. Okay. okay, in fact, we have a chart for that right there. Mm. People at home are seeing this. Was that Lot, Uza, Al Uza, yeah. and Manat? Yeah, Uza and Al Uza are the same. Their intercession was to be hoped for. Uh, all right, now, now, at one period of time when Muhammad and some of his followers were in exile in Ethiopia, and there was perhaps, we speculate, there was pressure on them to maybe placate the, the, the Meccans, there was a surah. Uh, uh, I mean, part of Surah 5319 talked about these three. It says, uh, and said their intercession, meaning their prayers by them, were to be hoped for. Now, Muhammad's followers, followers, I'm sure, were you know surprised and amazed that that would be in there. And this verse was abrogated. And this uh, was uh, was called the Satanic verses. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now there's a book uh, called the Satanic Verses Today, which basically has no um, it, it relationship to this, except they just picked up the title. But the but the study of the Satanic Verses and the abrogated verses is actually a study, you know, that Muslim scholars, because there's a whole Islamic science, if you will, of the abrogators and the abrogated. Uh, abrogated verses aren't usually thought of too much by Muslims today, but you can read about them in Surahs 13, 39, 16, 101, and Surahs 2, 106. So it, it, it discusses um, that uh, Allah doesn't abrogate a verse except that he gives something better. And there are other verses, we'll get into that later when we talk more about the Qaradis, about various verses that they were in there and then they were changed in the time of Muhammad. Mm -hmm. uh, so in Muhammad's time, the Quran on earth at least was actually changed. And Muhammad basically would say, well, this verse wasn't inspired by God in the first place. It got in there, it was inspired by Satan, and so it was taken out. It's like, well, how did something that wasn't inspired by God get in the Quran if the Quran is, you know, because right, you figure God. if the devil could sneak a verse in through Muhammad one way, mm -hmm. maybe there's some other ones that they don't know about that are still in there that right. were snuck in by the devil. Because if it could happen once, it can happen again. Mm -hmm. Hey, now, let's go back to this other chart where you had Allah was also a specific idol. I don't think we got your final conclusion. Okay. People can see your conclusion there on the chart. Go ahead and tell us. Well, uh, many people in the Greek language, as an analogy, uh, the Greek word for, for God is Theos, and that's a generic word. But then the Greek word for the chief of their gods is named Zeus, which was derived from Theos, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they believe. Now, so the fact that Zeus, a specific idol, was derived from a generic word for God doesn't mean that worshiping Zeus is okay, is not. Uh, so just a common language origin doesn't necessarily mean, you know, because it's generic, that doesn't mean that it couldn't also have been derived as specific also. Okay. Very good. Now let's go back to Muhammad then. I, I mentioned okay. before about, we already talked about Muhammad's wives and concubines. Uh, what about Muhammad as addressed as the prosperous? Okay. I've heard that Muhammad was very poor all of his life. Um, the Bukhari Hadith says otherwise. It says when and there's a chart for the viewers at home. Right. When when Allah made the prophet wealthy through conquests, so the prophet was wealthy. Now think about it, he would probably need some wealth, you know, to support all his wives. And of course he didn't necessarily work, you know, farming, you know, he was off teaching all the time, so to support himself, you know, he needed money, I guess, for that. Uh, Bukhari four one fifty three also mentions Muhammad's wealth. Um, of course they prayed on the caravans coming in and out of Mecca, and so they got money that way. Uh, but when they uh, massacred the, about 700 Jewish men at Kabar, and of course got all the goods and the wives, then he got especially wealthy there, along with you know the, another wife, Sophia. So Muhammad did have a lot of wealth, uh, and with his wives, you know, perhaps he needed it. Well, I found from doing a comparative religions uh, study uh, and analysis, having dealt in the countercult ministry through. Uh, you know, Christian ministries for the last 20 years, I found that uh, guys can get a lot of money 
running their own religion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I even remember L. Ron Hubbard, who started Scientology, said he he's going to make a lot of money by starting his own religion. He said that at a science fiction uh, convention, and he was a science fiction writer in 1949. The next year, he came out with a book called Dianetics yeah. in 1950, and he did make a lot of money. So uh, it's interesting that a lot of these uh, guys that start their own religions and things are wealthy, but we have specific references on Muhammad's wealth mm -hmm. mentioned right in the al Bukhari's the right. Hadiths. Uh, that are beyond dispute. Mm -hmm. So he was a wealthy man. Now, okay. what about him being? Uh, was Muhammad uh, was he sinless or was he a sinner? Okay. And you have a chart on this too. All right. In early Islam, and especially for example in Surah 40, 55, and 48, 1 and 2, they apparently had no problem saying that Muhammad was a sinner. However, Islam also acknowledges that Jesus was sinless. And so gradually Islam can say, well, if Jesus is sinless, then Muhammad must be sinless too. And so Muslims today uh, generally uh, think that Muhammad is sinless. All right, but in Surah 4055, Allah tells Muhammad to ask forgiveness for his sin. Okay. Now, one English translation I've seen, it doesn't say the word sin. It's a, it has the word frailty. But it's like, okay, well, why do you need to ask forgiveness for your frailty? You know, if you weren't physically strong or if you had some physical problem or something like that, and God made you that way, you don't need to ask forgiveness for that. You need to ask forgiveness for the things that you do wrong. Now, you're saying in a lot of the translations it says sin, but in another translation they put the word frailty in place of sin. In, in, in the English translation, and there are a couple other places where various uh, translators don't always translate so precisely when it's, I guess, in their interest. So, but you so. are saying, though, in, in Islamic publications, in English translations, it does say sin in some of them, and in others it says frailty. Right. And then another one, with, uh, a translation of is by Arbery, and I believe Arbery is, is uh, I do not believe that he is a Muslim, but he, uh, there's one on the, talks about the Trinity that he kind of messes, he makes that one extremely vague. But in, in, but anyway, going back to here, I right, assume for for example, assume for a sake of argument that it could be sin or frailty. Okay, you don't need to ask forgiveness for a physical frailty. You need to ask forgiveness for a moral frailty. Mm -hmm. And so this is acknowledging that Muhammad had moral frailties. Well, moral frailty is generally uh, a sin. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 so so anyway, um, you wonder well, what kinds of things would Muhammad need forgiveness for? Well, in the in the chart, you can see that the, there are many Bukhari hadiths. Many mentioned Muhammad's sins. Some of them include things like cutting off people's limbs, burning out their eyes, making them die of thirst. Uh, uh, Alright, so these things sound like pretty serious sins. I mean, I don't, don't personally know uh, of any people who've done that, you know, my personal acquaintance. So it's a, he's done a lot of worse things than the people that, I, that I've personally known. Um, so he definitely, in my book, it seems like he definitely was a sinner. Well, the key, the key, it all goes back to if you really believe the Quran is true, and you go to Surah 40, verses 55, and then also Surah 48, 1 and 2, mm -hmm. it talks about Allah asking him for forgiveness of his sin. And then, like we already said, there's already translations that read that way. Mm -hmm. And I think even in the Arabic, it's pretty strong. Uh, if you believe the Quran, you you're forced to the conclusion that he had to have been a sinner. Right. It's as simple as that. Yeah. Otherwise, you have to deny the validity of the Quran, or else you can say this verse should have been abrogated. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> this is another satanic verse that should have been thrown out, but they they accidentally left it in. Yeah, and and and, and, and Muslims actually do not say that. Okay. But but now the fact he was a sinner. I mean, we believe that Peter sinned. We believe that everybody was was sinless. Uh, I mean, everybody was a sinner, was a sinner uh, except, except, for, <laughs> except for Jesus. But if the Quran says that even Muhammad was a sinner, like we all are, and Jesus wasn't, that would tend to make Jesus, you know, have something unique that. Now Muhammad let me ask you this: to Make sure we clarify this, because you're the you're the expert here for this series, anyway. Uh, the Quran says Jesus was sinless. Yes. Or the or or does the Quran and the uh, Hadith say he's sinless, or is it just the Quran? Well, not only does the both the Quran and the Hadith say that Muhammad was a sinner, but the Hadith also say that Jesus was born without sin. So, in the Bukhari Hadith, uh, volume 4, uh, number 506, actually page 324. Now, that is an Islamic publication published by the Muslims themselves. Yes, and this is actually part of the basis for the Muslim Sharia, or the Sunni Islamic law. Uh, it, uh, is a, is a hadith, and it says this, narrated Abu Huraira, 
The prophet said, when any human being is born, Satan touches him at both sides of, his, of the body with his two fingers, except Jesus, the son of Mary, whom Satan tried to touch but failed, for he touched the placenta instead. So while Muslims will acknowledge that Jesus was born without sin and everybody else did have sin, uh, and, and Muhammad asked forgiveness for his sins, uh, which he needed to do. In fact, uh, you know, as our, our, our chart that are showing, Muhammad was not sinless. So this is coming in, in all references are there for the people at home to see. And we'll just leave that up for a while. And I'd like to read some other quotes from the uh, Hadith and uh, let you comment on each one, Steve, after I, I mention them. Okay. okay. Uh, if we go to uh, uh, the Hadith, Volume 1, this is out of Al-Bukhari, mm -hmm. number 711, it says, uh, when Muhammad was asked by Abdu Hurera, what do you say in the pause between takbir and recitation? Muhammad replied, I say, O Allah, set me apart from my sins as the east and the west are set apart from each other and clean me from sins as a white garment is cleaned of dirt after thorough washing. O oh Allah, wash off my sins with water, snow, and hail, end quote. Okay. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like he knew that he needed cleansing. <laughs> cleansing from what? From, from, from his sins. And all of us need That's cleansing. That's not symbolic? Or would you, from all your reading and understanding of, of uh, Muslim writings and, and their authors and things, could that be misconstrued as maybe just symbolic of something other than uh, moral frailties and evil, and it was just something. No, it, it, uh, from my understanding, was that uh, Muhammad wasn't playing around. He wasn't fooling people, uh, but he was, you know, wanting forgiveness for his sins. Um, so therefore, he had sins. Right. And therefore, it would make sense what you read out of the hadith a minute ago from that book right there, mm -hmm. that uh, Satan did touch him. Yeah. And he did have sins. So Muhammad right. had to be a sinner. Right. And, 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 and as, as are all of us, you know, right, right. Muslims, Christians, non-Christians, but, everything. But Muhammad's a sinner, but Jesus is not. Right. According but, to Islamic teachings. Right. So there's something special about Jesus. You know, if you read the Bukhari, even in the Bukhari Hadith, there's something special that merits closer inspection about right. Jesus. Uh, so it's just interesting that Muhammad, who I think is esteemed higher by Muslims than even Jesus. Yes even though they always say peace and blessings be upon his name every time they mention his name, mm -hmm. it still seems that they esteem Muhammad greater than Jesus, even though Jesus was the one who was without sin right. while Muhammad had some. Right. I, 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 I also, uh, Muslims uh, accept the fact that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, mm -hmm. okay, which, of course, Christians completely agree with. Uh, of course, Muhammad had a father and mother like, you know, like regular people. Um, so the, the, there is a high view of Jesus. It's just they don't, you know, they need to listen to, what, to, what he, to his words. Okay, now in Hadith number 319, volume 8, Abdu Herrera said, I heard Allah's apostle saying, quote, By Allah, I ask for forgiveness from Allah and turn to him in repentance more than 70 times a day, end quote. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, what, can, can I logically infer from this this passage from the Hadith that Muhammad was sinning at least seventy times a day if he had to repent for it? He felt he needed to repent seventy times a day. Yeah. So, I mean, this is this is to me implying that he's committing at least seventy sins a day because he's having to repent seventy times a day. Mm -hmm. Now that looks like he's doing some some pretty heavy duty singing even for <laughs> Allah's apostle. Yeah. And this is coming from Islamic sources. Right, right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to say there before I read the next one? Uh, no, n uh, not about sins. Uh, there is a very interesting thing is that uh, the Bukhari Hadith, actually Aisha, one of Muhammad's wives, says that Muhammad was bewitched. You know, he was under a spell. And it, it, it actually says, um, uh, narrated Aisha, magic was worked on the prophet so that he began to fancy that he was doing a thing which he was not actually doing. One day he invoked Allah for a long period and then said, I feel that Allah has inspired me as to how to cure myself. You can read this for yourself in Bukhari.
Zakari, volume 4, number 490, on page 317. Uh, also, volume 4, number 400, page 267, or volume 8, number 400. So, in other words, someone else, an evil magician, cast a spell on Muhammad, which worked. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Christians teach that uh, Christians cannot be possessed by demons or under spells, um, but non-Christians could, and here is a spell that, according to Muhammad's wife, worked on Muhammad. Now, it's interesting. I, uh, I don't know if the, the camera can see this or not, but uh, getting ready for this uh, particular series, uh, I was, I was uh, listening to this tape series. It's a series of interviews with Dr. Jamal Badawi, and it's called Islamic Teachings. This is package number eight, and it's it's filled with Dr. Badawi's teachings. And uh, I was specifically going through some of his lectures on uh, Jesus mm -hmm. in the Islamic perspective. And uh, Dr. Badawi, of course, is one of the the best Muslim scholars I believe in on the North American continent. He's coming out of uh, Canada. And uh, I find him to be a very nice and pleasant man. I think he's very well respected in the Islamic community uh, and being knowledgeable of Islam. And uh, listening to uh, what he was saying on his tapes, uh, he mentioned, I believe it was in tape number three in a particular series here I was listening to, he said that Satan uh, has no impact on people like if they are close to Allah. Huh. He mentioned that as he was discussing, you know, some of the peculiarities that can uh, be associated and difficulties we associate with people who are, who are far from Allah. That mm -hmm. Satan has, I think he said something to the effect that Satan has no power okay. over those types of people. Now, to me, it sounds like I'm hearing a little difference here from what you're saying about Muhammad's wife mm -hmm. and what I'm hearing from Dr. Badawi on his, his Islamic teachings. Right. Uh, it seems that if if I didn't know what you had just quoted me from the Hadith about Muhammad's wife. Saying about Muhammad, yeah. Exactly, then uh, I would just, that because I believe Dr. Battle is a, a sincere man and mm -hmm. he's, he's faithful to what he believes in his religion, but I would have to say there's a discrepancy between what I'm hearing. I would have to say that it looks like from what we're getting from the Hadith that there, the Satan did have power mm -hmm. over Allah's ap apostle based on what we're reading. I mean, to me, that seems to be very significant. Yeah. And uh, if you could just, uh, for, for a minute or two, mention to the viewer that what we're getting from the teachings of, of the Quran and the teachings of the Al-Bakari Hadith which are all Islamic teachings. We're not sitting here and just making this stuff up. We're giving you the references. We're, we're showing you the quotes. Uh, we're, 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 uh, we're seeing that the, the Islamic teachings themselves are saying that Jesus is sinless, but Muhammad is a sinner who has to ask for repentance 70 times a day. I've got a bunch of other... Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, let, let, let me just say modern Islamic teachings generally say he's sinless. Earlier ones did not say Right, that. as you stated that before, but... We're going to stick to what we're reading from the Islamic sources, which we believe mm -hmm. to be authoritative. I believe the Quran. Well, they are authoritative. I, I believe the, yeah. the, the, the Hadith and the Quran are authoritative. And they're telling us Muhammad was a sinner, and, and here's his wife in the Hadith saying that he could be bewitched and, and the devil would have power over him. But when we. Now, now let's, let's kind of contrast to the Lord Jesus, who the Quran and Muhammad are saying is, is sinless. Mm -hmm. And the devil has no power on it. In fact, the devil couldn't even touch Jesus when he was born, according to what we read in the Hadiths. So our Muslim viewers, they have to take this in. If they're true Muslims, they've got to believe mm -hmm. what the Hadith says. And the devil couldn't even touch Jesus. Right. But apparently the devil could bewitch Muhammad, even after he's Apollo, uh, the Allah's apostle. Mm -hmm. now, now, go ahead. Now, now what I want you to start talking about here for a few minutes, is the significance of this. Now from a biblical perspective, uh, talk about Jesus and his power over the devil that even even the Hadith acknowledge. 
Mm -hmm. In contrast to Muhammad here, are we seeing a, a quite a bit of a difference here between these two, as they are called in Muslim writings, prophets? Right. Uh, we, we never see Jesus asking forgiveness for anything. Uh, we do, however, see Satan trying to tempt Jesus and trying to touch him. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, also uh, when, Luke chapter 4, Matthew yeah. 4 and Luke 4. It, when, uh, when Jesus was went to the wilderness, he was tempted by Satan. And in every case, uh, Jesus ans Jesus passed and, 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 and you know, he asked to command the stone to become bread, to, to throw yourself off the mountain, everything I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus uh, rebuked Satan using scripture. And he used the words in English, it says, it is written. And that's a pretty good translation of the Greek, but not really too precise. In Greek, it's actually much stronger. You could almost translate it, it stands on record. Mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and, and then he quotes from the Old Testament, things like, you know, uh, uh, worship God and serve him only. Uh, you know, and, and, and so Jesus rebuked Satan, uh, and he passed every time. And in the book of Hebrews, it says Jesus was just like us, you know, fully human, except without sin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have some, somebody uh, who, who, um, who was sinless and gave us a message, and then we have someone else uh, who was a sinner, like the rest of us, and gave us a message. Now, Muslims, they will generally answer this by saying, well, Jesus may have originally given all his words, but they say, well, they got corrupted. In the Old Testament, they say they got corrupted too. Now, now, just before you go on with that thought, I thought the Quran, and with your knowledge and having read the Quran from cover to cover, I thought the Quran gave uh, uh, praise basically to the people of the book and to the scripture, the Bible per se, as mm -hmm. being something that was worthy of being studied. Yes, and, and, and in a contradictory way, it does. It, it actually says that Jesus was taught the Torah and given the angel, angel meaning the gospel. Okay, when Jesus quoted from scripture to rebuke Satan, he quoted from the Old Testament. Okay, now we have, uh, I've uh, read in, in Yusuf Ali's translation of the Quran, uh, where he has a footnote saying that the earliest Jewish scriptures that we have preserved today were at, just after 900 AD. Okay, that is a false obsolete statement. Um, it's kind of like saying before you throw stones at the Bible, you might want to remember that some Arab boys, they were throwing stones inside a cave when they heard a bunch of jars breaking, and what they found there were uh, hundreds and hundreds of scrolls, today called the Dead Sea Scrolls. Mm -hmm. And we have copies of many books of the Old Testament from before Christ was born as well as during the time Christ was born. And we can compare those, and we can see that it's uh, basically the same thing that we have today. A few uh, scribble errors, there are a few things to where the dialect may have changed, but the meaning is the same. And you're saying that like the Dead Sea Scrolls predate the Quran. Oh, predate but, Muhammad but, 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 by but, hundreds of years. 600 years, yes. 600 years difference. And so when the Muslim apologists, uh, like, Dr. Badawi, let's say, or many other ones, mm -hmm. they would they would argue, well, the Bible's corrupted. Are they actually dealing with the forensic evidence, such as you're mentioning here, Dead Sea Scrolls, manuscript evidence, things of this nature? No, they, they, they must not be, because we have hard and fast evidence of the day of the Dead Sea Scrolls. First, we have radiocarbon dating. Now, radiocarbon dating at that period of time can date, you know, 2,000 years ago, plus or minus 200 years, okay? So it's not maybe even a little bit more precise than that. So, so it can't well, be the exact year. Just in case, we weren't going to mention this, but the viewers at home don't realize that uh, Steve, my dear brother in the Lord here, he has a PhD. And he, he is a doctor, actually. But he has a PhD in chemical engineering. So whenever he talks about this scientific stuff like he's doing right now, I, I really believe him, okay? <laughs> the guy's got a PhD and he's talking about this dating, carbon dating, all. So. Anyway, I've just, I just had to throw that in okay. because I, I figure when you're talking scientific data, you really know what you're uh, talking about. But anyway, well, go ahead. I, I'll, I'll keep it simple. But mm -hmm. anyway, so, so that is one piece of evidence so that we know when the scrolls are written. Mm -hmm. A second piece of evidence is that the Romans came and destroyed Jerusalem and sacked the whole surrounding area at 70 a, in 70 A.D. 
and the Dead Sea Scrolls are basically in caves, they're put in jars and they're buried to protect them from the Romans. And this was prior to the Romans destroying everything, including the Qumran community in mm -hmm. 70 AD. So at the very, very latest, any scroll among the Dead Sea Scrolls was written, you know, 70 AD. But we actually have a couple that through dating and also other uh, paleographic evidence we know were written a couple hundred years before Christ, an, an Isaiah scroll before Christ, for, uh, for example. So we have copies of the Old Testament from the time of Christ. We can actually see the Old Testament that Jesus read. Mm -hmm. And it agrees with the Old Testament today. It does not agree with the Quran. It does not have the, the message of, of Muhammad. Uh, we actually have copies of the New Testament. We have a, a fragment from the Gospel of Luke that was found uh, about 100 AD. Uh, we have a fragment of the, of the Gospel of John, called the John, uh, John Ryland's manuscript, from about 125 A.D., sometimes you see 115, sometimes 130, but, but from, from that range. And we have other copies from 150 to 200 A.D. and from 200 A.D. And so we, we have... And overall we're testament. talking about thousands of manuscript copies going back. Uh, we, have, we have maybe about, oh, uh, over 24,000 manuscripts, that's including both Greek manuscripts and manuscripts copied in other languages like Ethiopian, Coptic, uh, 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 Armenian. And I've heard that that, that number dwindles down uh, to your really ancient manuscripts and going way back, still it's in the thousands, so maybe you know, three to five thousand, but still, and not 24,000, but still when you go way back, you still have thousands of copies. Yeah, it, it would, yeah. Depending on on on, on what date the time you have. period, right? Yeah. You know, I mean, it, obviously the number reduces as you go further and further back in time. But mm -hmm. the key is, we still have just a lot of manuscript evidence going back. Substantiating right. what we have today, and, and and it's not just Bible manuscripts, but we have the early church fathers um, that wrote about uh, the the scriptures. Uh, Clement of Rome wrote 97 or 98 A.D., and he alludes, for example, to a verse in the Book of Hebrews, mm -hmm. you know, which we think is probably one of the later books written. Well, that's an outstanding point, and uh, it's a point that shouldn't be missed by our viewers because when you look at the Bible and you go to early church history, like you're talking about. And they have all these books and writings by these early church fathers and what they wrote and things, Irenaeus against heresies or whatever. If you take all those early church writers, they're quoting Bible verses. I mean, when I write articles for Christian Answers or Steve writes, we're always quoting the Bible. We're always quoting verses and whatever. Well, they do the same thing. The early church fathers, they're quoting verses right. out of the Bible. They to love substantiate. To quote the Bible. Yeah, we all love to quote the Bible if you're a Christian. And so there, if you take... And I read somewhere that if you take all the verses quoted by the early church writers and they're rewriting them, you know, just quoting them in their writings, you have almost the whole Bible is there in the early church fathers' writings except for a few verses. Yeah, I think I think Sir uh, Dalrymple calculated was like ex all the New Testament except for 17 verses. You know, right. just just taking the writings up to 325 AD. Right, and so. Even with all this incredible manuscript evidence, <laughs> uh, you've got the early church fathers who are writing from the scriptures they had at the time, and their dates are beyond dispute. Mm -hmm. You know, these guys lived in certain epochs of time, certain periods and eras, and they're set in, set in stone time-wise, and they're quoting the Bible, and those quotes are still here with us today. Right. And so when those verses they quote are not liked by the Muslims, and they they decide to disprove them because or they don't believe them because they disagree with the Quran. They basically have to disagree with all the history and manuscript evidence that are there in existence. Right. So the bottom line is that if the Bible and uh, the we have today is corrupted, then it could be that Islam might be true. But if the Bible we have today is not corrupted, then there is no way that Islam can be true because. They, they're just too different, and they say contradictory things. Now, we're running out of time, but in this series, we're going to go into this in much more detail. Now, we've got one, one more chart left here. I want to get this up before the show's out. Steve, you can comment on this. Uh, you have the chart, and the readers, uh, people at home can see it. Consider the sinless prophet. Mm -hmm. Okay, could you take us through that? What, well, uh, I, you know, besides Muhammad, there's one other person who claimed to be God's prophet. There were 400 prophecies and implications in the Old Testament about him, about Jesus. Uh, Muslims try to find things in the Old Testament about uh, Muhammad. There is none there. Uh, they tried in a few places, and we will get into those places later. Uh, but, but there's over 400 things that, that 
the, the messianic, messianic prophecies written by the Old Testament prophets right. about Jesus Christ. Right, messianic not prophecies. Not about either. Muhammad, but about Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, now, Jesus was never forgiven. I mean, it sounds like a bad thing, but it actually is a good thing. He was never forgiven because he never had a need for forgiveness. He never had any <laughs> sin. Okay? He didn't kill any travelers or, or he didn't pray in caravans. Uh, he didn't act, let's say, like a, a Muslim extremist today in any way at all. Um, he had high moral standards. He never said sex with captives was okay under any circumstances or anything like that. Uh, furthermore, Jesus isn't just sitting out there. He promised to pay the penalty for your sin. Okay? And he suffered on the cross and, and, by, and died for you. And, you know, by his body and blood shed on the cross, he paid for your sin. Jesus doesn't have a tomb. Uh, it'd be great, you know, you say to, to go, if we could visit Jesus' grave, like many Shiites visit graves of Shiite saints, but we can't do it because Jesus' grave isn't here. He rose from the dead. His grave is empty. Okay. And, you know, and we don't always say, well, we hope to benefit Jesus by saying, you know, may the peace of God be in Jesus. Uh, the, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. His peace, we need His peace on us. That's right. And we, and, and we praise God that He is the source of our, our salvation. Uh, and, and He not only just showed us the way, but He said, as He said, He was the way, the truth he, and life. He is, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by Him. Jesus said that in John chapter 14, verse 6. Mm -hmm. And uh, that verse was there long before Muhammad came along. Right. Along with a bunch of other verses mm -hmm. <laughs> that... Uh, Con that conflict with Islamic teaching. So, as we, we sum up the show, Steve, uh, as we there'll be many more shows in this series as we delve into the more Islamic teachings. Uh, what can we say then to answer the question that we started the show with? Can the Muslim religion send you to hell? Okay. What can we say based on that with time running out? All right. Well, based upon the evidence that we started to present in this series, there's a lot more uh, in, in the other series, is that Christianity in the Bible that we, has been preserved is not the same religion from the same God as Islam. It's a totally different religion. One has to be right. Uh, well, I mean, one has to be wrong, you know, and it, they, 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 they cannot both be right. And so uh, if Christianity is correct, and if you reject the only way that your sins will be paid for, and you know, for, for, for a just and partial God, then there is no other way to get to heaven. And if, so if you reject Jesus Christ, uh, as as a sacrificing atonement for your sins, then you will not go to heaven with the people who have accepted Christ as their sins. Okay, and we'll get into that even more in, in the shows to come. Mm -hmm. well, Steve, thanks for being with us. Okay. Uh, viewers out there, contact our ministry. The address and phone number will come up at the end of the show. If you're interested in a free subscription to our newsletter, the Christian Answers uh, newsletter, or if you want a free resource list and other items, uh, information on Islam, whatever, Give us a call. I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Thank you for being with us. God bless you all. Islam is the gospel of unbelief. Listen now to Dr. James White in a recent debate he had with a Muslim apologist explain the problem in Islamic thought. Tremendously clear that to make the claim that they do, Islamic representatives must ignore the context of the New Testament itself, skip past the plethora of passages that teach the truth they do not believe, and most importantly, I believe, allow external authorities such as the Quran and their own beliefs to overthrow the plain testimony of Scripture. Indeed, this is admitted by one Islamic writer who honestly said, quoting, speaking of the New Testament, quote, it is absolutely impossible to get at the truth, the true religion, from these Gospels unless they are read and examined from an Islamic and Unitarian point of view, end quote. That's Dawood, by the way. In other words, unless you assume the falsity of Christianity, ignore the context of the New Testament, and instead insert what you seek to prove, you'll never find the true religion in the New Testament. But of course, that's circular argumentation. And that's the problem. Muslims simply do not believe Jesus, his disciples, or Christ's scripture testimony, and therefore end up believing only what they want to believe and thus deny Christ and his gospel. The consequence then is found in 2 Thessalonians, which states, and to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, 
dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Muslim friend, please do not make this eternal mistake, but believe what Jesus said and not what Muhammad said, for Islam is a religion of unbelief and of making an idol of Muhammad a man who denied what Christ said. Check out our websites, BibleQuery.org. This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. HistoryCart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 